Hello friends, Josh Steffler here for Freedom Free For All Television and we are ChangeVictoria.org, your community access television. We're here at the BC Legislature for two coinciding events, the opening of the Spring Legislature Session and the red carpet for all of our betters, and for the Sensible BC protest of prohibition and protesting draconian cannabis laws. We are going to go and talk to some crowd, talk to the crowd, and ask some questions about why people are here, and uh, get some real voices on television. Let's go. Hi, I'm with. I'm Dana Larson, the director of Sensible BC. And what's going on here today, Dana? Well, today we're showing our support for sensible marijuana reform in British Columbia. we got about 200 people outside the legislature grounds. Today is the uh, first day of the new session. It's a throne speech today. And we wanted our MLAs and our media to know that Sensible BC is not going anywhere and that it's time to reform the marijuana laws in British Columbia as a province. So do you have any comment on the, uh, the referendum? Yeah, well, we made a good effort. We got over 200,000 signatures, which would have qualified us for a vote under any other referendum system in the world. Unfortunately, here in BC, it's remarkably difficult to get on the ballot. But I feel good about what we accomplished. 200,000 people is a significant number. And uh, we've definitely got ongoing support for this campaign to continue. All of our volunteers and our canvassers and our team, they're excited about continuing with the campaign and moving forward. And we're not going anywhere until we win and until marijuana is decriminalized and then legalized in Canada. So, decriminalize or legalize, and why? Well, we want both, really. You know, do, these words mean different things to different people, but our campaign was to stop a marijuana arrests in British Columbia, stop arrests for marijuana possession, to effectively decriminalize at the provincial level. We have the power to do that. We can tell the RCMP. We can make them stop arresting people for marijuana possession, which has actually doubled over the past seven years. So we're going the other way in British Columbia. We're now spending over $10 million a year just to charge and convict people for marijuana possession. That's a waste of police resources. But ultimately, we want to change the federal law so that marijuana is legalized, so adults can buy marijuana, so they can grow marijuana in a reasonable and regulated way. The first step is decriminalization, but our goal is legalization. So, do you have any comment on the uh, effect that prohibition has on our fundamental liberties uh, in Canada? Oh, well, prohibition is a terrible failure. It failed for alcohol and it's failing for marijuana. It costs a lot of money. It criminalizes people who should not be criminalized. It clogs up our justice system, wastes police resources, causes a lot of harm and misery. Uh, marijuana is also a wonderful medicinal plant as well, and we're missing out on the benefits of that because of this prohibition. Uh, it's time to legalize marijuana. Canadians are ready for it. British Columbians are ready for it, but our politicians are lagging behind. That's why we're here today. So what do you think about British Columbia being surrounded by states in the United States that have legalized or decriminalized? Well, and of course Alaska has just got the signatures they need, so they're going to be voting this uh, August, and we're going to have states on both sides of the border now that, that have legalized marijuana. Uh, I think a lot of us here in Canada thought that BC and Canada would be first to change this before the US, but now we're lagging behind. And you know, it's also one of our province's biggest industries. It's an economic powerhouse for British Columbia, the marijuana industry. Some estimates say it employs a quarter million people in this province, make their living from the marijuana industry. This is a huge what's happening. However you feel about the cannabis industry and about legalization, we should have people in Washington, in Colorado, in Alaska, seeing what's going on, seeing how it's going to impact our economy here in British Columbia. If they were drastically changing their forestry or their fishing procedures in those, in those states, we'd be looking at it. And yet with cannabis, our BC government's just ignoring this issue entirely. It's a terrible mistake that we're going to pay for a drastic economic price in our province. So have you heard any deaths related to the legalization in Colorado or Washington? There's, nobody's died except for the hopes of those who want to keep marijuana illegal. But uh, no, marijuana is very safe, certainly safer than alcohol. And, uh, and yet in BC, our government's increasing access to alcohol, uh, and yet they're increasing arrests for marijuana possession. So they're driving us to drink. And uh, you know, the fact is, however you feel about cannabis, it's safer to be a cannabis user than an alcohol user. And our laws and our regulations should reflect that reality. 
So what's the future look like for Sensible BC? Uh, we've got a busy year ahead. I'm going to be traveling around the province with others. We're going to be doing talking. We're going to be organizing events, training our canvassers more, building on our best practices from the referendum campaign. We're hoping to put on a, uh, a, a convention in the fall in September in Vancouver and bring people from all over the province for that event. And we're going to keep the pressure on. We're not going to give up until we win and until marijuana is legalized. And we are going to win eventually. Perfect. Uh, one final question. Uh, you ran for the leader of the BC NDP before. Are you considering a run this time? I did run against Adrian Dix, and I don't think I'm going to be running again, but uh, it's kind of depressing that it's such an empty field and that nobody's put their name forward, and I would love to see a candidate put forward some of the same ideas that I was putting forward, which would include, of course, decriminalizing marijuana as a province. So thank you, Dana, for your time. Uh, would you like to give one final message to the public? Well, if you want to find out more, visit us at sensiblebc.ca. Get involved in this campaign because this is an issue whose time has come. But if we don't get it over the top now, there's no reason these laws could not persist for a long time in the future. So let's get together. Let's decriminalize. Let's legalize. Let's end the war on marijuana. Thank you so much. Uh, my pleasure. Thank you. Take care. Hi there, I'm with Ted Smith and we're going to ask a few questions. Uh, Ted, what's going on today? Well, today we're gathering here at the opening of the BC Legislature to let Christy Clark and the general public know that this issue of cannabis decriminalization is not going away, that we are going to see to it that this happens and you know, we want to let her know from the day that she's coming to work this year that this is an important issue that she's going to have to deal with in her term. Legalize or decriminalize? Well, in the long run it's all about legalizing cannabis. In the short run, the goal of this campaign is specific towards decriminalizing. So, you know, we can convince the police here at least to stop arresting us and prosecuting us, but it doesn't make it legal so that it would be available in stores and, you know, otherwise, um, uh, you know, in the marketplace. So it'd be in this really quasi-legal sort of status. Uh, to happen legally, it would have to happen as a, a national, either political you know agenda it can't happen in courts courts could essentially decriminalize it by striking it down so that you know you can't be charged or convicted anymore um, but that wouldn't be legalization either so you know legalization is a different political step than this so with the United States being the biggest perpetrator on the war on drugs how do you feel about British Columbia almost being surrounded by states that have legalized or at least decriminalized? Well, I think it's fundamental that the United States is leading the way in change. If you go back 10 years ago in the news, you know, we had Chrétien talking about how he couldn't decriminalize possession here in Canada or they'd shut down the borders at the United States. I find it ironic that our conservative government isn't talking about shutting down the U.S. border now that it's legal there. You know, so the tables have turned now and it's been wonderful because without that change, you know, we would be uh, still stuck in a completely, you know, illegal situation. Um, but uh, because the change is finally happening from the other direction and the pressure is happening from the United States to change our laws towards legalizing it, you know, it's going to happen. It's just a matter of time. Even despite our conservative government, if the United States and every other country around the world makes it legal, we will too. So, uh, you know, in a way, uh, it's, it's wonderful. It, it has to happen that way. So, is there anything you'd like to say to the public uh, now that you're on television? Well, um... There's a lot of issues going on with cannabis. This campaign in British Columbia to decriminalize is one. But in a way, more importantly, for patients across Canada, there's a change going on with the federal regulations. Currently, patients can grow their own cannabis or have a designated grower provide for them. As of April 1st, the new medical marijuana um, regulations will stop patients from doing this and will force them to buy their cannabis off of large corporations, licensed producers, so people won't be able to provide their own medicines anymore and uh, they'll become criminals as of April 1st. And so 
Um, this abhorrent situation is being protested um, by myself and many others on April 1st in Ottawa. We're flying to Parliament Hill to have a press conference and a rally uh, right there. It's uh, And so uh, it's something that uh, is really important for people to be involved with. Even if you can't make it to Ottawa on April 1st, there'll certainly be a media campaign uh, leading up to it where people can call the media, write letters, do whatever it takes. Um, if you can get a copy of our news Newspaper, the Cannabis Digest. Um, there's articles explaining the rally and the change in regulations here. It's available online if you can't find a hard copy as well. And uh, there is a court case going on March the 18th. John Conroy uh, is leading a litigation in the federal court in Vancouver trying to force an injunction upon the federal government so that patients can continue to grow their own medicine after April 1st. And so to support that, uh, we are having a benefit concert here at Hush on February 26th, Wednesday 26th. Um, it's just some DJs playing at, at the show. It's just 10 bucks to get in, but we need to do everything we can to raise money for the lawyers because there's not much we can do in court, but we certainly can uh, help uh, cover the legal fees for that. And so uh, this is a, an important issue. If you can't make it to this event, obviously, you can check out the uh, MMAR Coalition Against uh, Repeal. Uh, they have web pages you can donate to as well. Uh, it's a very important legal battle because patients uh, need to be able to provide their own medicine. And even if people aren't uh, patient themselves or know of any, one would hope or expect that we would all, you know, die of old age after getting arthritis and God knows what else. And, you know, and that would be the point where it would be important for you to grow your own. But now is when you're going to lose that right. And so for people like myself that are healthy, that know how good cannabis is as medicine, now is their chance to fight. Because if we lose our right to grow now, we'll lose it for a very long time. And all that will be able to grow medicine legally will be these large corporations taxing the shit out of it. Excuse my French. All right. Thanks, Ted. Thanks so much. Thanks, Josh. I'm here with... Yusuf. And... Liam. So why are you guys here today? Well, we're here today to sort of come out in support of uh, decriminalizing pot. Of course, the Sensible BC petition happened about two months ago, and though it didn't pass, there's a lot of support province-wide, and we just want to carry on the momentum and show that this is something that still needs to happen in BC, definitely. And you're here? Uh, for much the same reasons. Um, as you have mentioned, we were not able to trigger a referendum, but the fact remains that we garnered more signatures than any initiative petition in BC history, excluding the HST. Uh, 200,000 signatures in three months is a monumental feat and we want to show that we're not going anywhere. So how do you guys feel about uh, the United States and the them being the biggest participant in the war on drugs legalizing marijuana before British Columbia? It's kind of ironic actually, yeah, like I said, the other day we were the instigator of the war on drugs uh, in the 1970s, of course, uh, and then now we got states like Washington, Colorado, or legalized, you have the city of uh, Portland, Maine, who, uh, Maine Port yeah, who voted to, to de uh, decriminalize as well. Now Alaska is going to have a referendum, uh, a vote to also decriminalize statewide, even though their laws are also, they're, all, they're already in the process like that. It's, it's really interesting and it's nice to see. Uh, it's almost motivated us a little bit more because, of course, we're BC and we have the reputation of, of being a little liberal with, with our marijuana with our marijuana laws so it's, it's the thing I think it's about time for it to happen here well I think it really speaks to uh, the differences in requirements for triggering referendums in the say Washington Colorado and British Columbia I mean yes they succeeded before us in actually triggering the referendum but standards are much lower in those states than they are in British Columbia. They have one electoral district. They just must collect a certain percentage of the entire voting population. In British Columbia, we must collect 10% of voter support in each of the 85 electoral districts. The timeline uh, was also quite different. They had about um, twice as much time, at least. In, in one of the states, they had six months. In one of them, they had 12 months. Here, we had three months. So. With the amount of time we had and the money uh, we had to spend and the logistical barriers of uh, geography and electoral districts, um, we're quite proud of how it went. Perfect. What do you guys think about uh, the government seizing authority over your bodies and telling you that you have no right to enjoy this plant? Do you believe that the government has the lawful authority and dominion over life and nature itself? Well, no, absolutely not. I actually started um, consuming cannabis for medical reasons. Uh, I, I was 
delivered three stomach afflictions in a row between uh, December 2011 and the end of February 2012. And for some time, cannabis was the only thing that allowed me to eat, that allowed me to sleep, allowed me to attend class. So I think I... I think I'm a pretty reasonable judge of what's working for my body and what isn't. I can say with 100% uh, certainty there were some days that I could not have slept or eaten if I was not consuming cannabis. Um, if your question regards cannabis or regards lawful authority over anything, over any type of body, uh, as someone, some women's rights issues, then of, of course not. You know that they they have no power, and as much as they would try to do so, um, reasonably speaking, they they won't be able to have the, the force to even uh, force those laws, to enforce those laws. So, I think final question on the cannabis, uh, legalize or decriminalize? And why? Uh, legalize. Um, decriminalizing, it would remove you know, the criminal penalty, but there may be as well a ticket or a fine that people are dealing with. I don't believe that consuming cannabis is an activity that should be penalized in any way. And I'd also rather see a uh, regulated market for cannabis open up where consumers would know exactly what they're getting, what kinds of products are used in growing the cannabis that they consume, what types of potency. This kind of information is not going to be available to consumers under the kind of market we're dealing with now. Thanks. Legalize, of course, to uh, legalize, tax, and regulate. Uh, because hey, if you want to do, if you do in fact want to control uh, the presence of this culture, then you have to be the one regulating the supply and tax. I've never seen a group of people so willing to say, take more money from us or, or take the money. It's a great source of revenue for the government, which is, of course they desperately need for anything useful, whether it be education or healthcare, rather than having to cut programs uh, consistently all the time. So definitely legalize, because decriminalize it's only halfway measure. Okay, hi, I'm here with... Neil Magnuson. And who are you with? Oh, I'm kind of with the world here, you know. I mean, I'm an activist, a rights activist in Canada for the last 10 years. I've been uh, dedicated to uh, trying to solve the issues of freedom for the most part. Uh, my main issue is the cannabis issue. That uh, I think that the most glaring and obvious example of how we're not free is the prohibition of this natural medicinal herb and, you know, all that it could be used for. So, uh, yeah, I've done numerous projects uh, over the last decade in trying to solve this issue. So what's going on here today? Why are you here? Well, we're protesting the uh, outrageous expenditure of taxpayer dollars on having uh, people arrested in British Columbia for small amounts of marijuana. Those people are certainly no threat to anybody. We don't need to have the police intervene and, and arrest these people to protect <laughs> society, you know. Uh, it's a huge waste of tax dollars. It's protecting corporations and it's protecting gangs. It's the reason that we have gangs here. So, uh, you know, this is... Uh, part of the sensible BC team that uh, ran uh, the campaign just recently here in British Columbia trying to get a referendum on the issue which we were unsuccessful in getting but that's due to the extremely stringent rules they have about getting referendums uh, had uh, this uh, been done just about in any other jurisdiction in North America it would have uh, would have succeeded but uh, I mean we were we required double the votes to what they required in Colorado and Washington and they have you know four times the population and they had longer to get the votes and they didn't have to go jurisdiction by jurisdiction a whole bunch of different things that make it extremely difficult to, to satisfy those requirements. Uh, so in that first run we were unsuccessful but we remain a good solid team motivated to still get the job done and uh, we'll be building for another referendum down the road uh, when it's the right time to do it and in the meantime this is the opening of the legislature in BC first time in 200 days that uh, our public servants have actually had to go and sit and do a job so uh, you know a pretty good job for a servant these days I guess guess you know and uh, we're here to just remind them that uh, they should think hard about this uh, proposal that we have through Sensible, Sensible BC an initiative to change the policing act to make it uh, so that the police cannot intervene with citizens with small amounts of marijuana for possession only and uh, hopefully we'll be successful down the road but really Christy Clark should implement uh, that initiative immediately and stop the wasting of these tax dollars uh, we need all of those tax dollars and more to deal with the issue issues we have in today's world for sure. So if you had a choice, is it decriminalize or legalize? 
Well, legalized for sure. Uh, decrim is a word that uh, represents several different models. Uh, many of the decrim models are not uh, positive models, in our opinion, as activists. Uh, we think it's just a, a changing of penalties and a widening of the net and more motivation for police to intervene. People that are choosing to use a medicinal herb are not criminals. We don't need the government to intervene. Um, a crime is intentionally causing harm to somebody else. And uh, they've skewed the whole idea and notion of what a crime is by having these laws that prohibit adults from accessing what is just a natural plant. So these laws were never meant to protect people, even though they said originally that, that marijuana and heroin and, and cocaine, they made people violent and insane. And, and so that on behalf of society they had to intervene and, and stop people from po even possessing this stuff because they'd go violent and insane. They said it was like putting a loaded handgun in the hand of a maniac. So, But it turns out that's not the truth and especially with cannabis, if anything it's a violent suppressor and uh, we don't have to have people arrested for having marijuana. Um, so, so, I forgot my last question. Uh, Regulation and legalization, that's what we're looking for. Legalization in that adults get to have whatever they want unless they're hurting somebody else. It's a natural plant. You can grow for yourself and your family and your friends whatever you want in any amount of blueberries and strawberries and any other plant that you want. And if you have too much and you want to sell it to the public, well then you might need to have a license to make sure that you flushed for pesticides or other things that might be a, a problem in society. And that's where the government has a role to play in things. But legalization for cannabis because it's a plant people get to grow plants and use them for whatever they want unless they're hurting somebody else regulation for that moment when you decide you want to distribute what you have to the general public and put up a sign buy from me then there may be some reason to have government regulation on like I say purity of product or age restrictions or whatever regulations and restrictions we can have on things we have substances in our environment that have the potential to harm people, that can cause people to become dead, you know, uh, harmed by the, the, the effects of it, um, addicted in ways that cause them to make bad choices about things, have their minds blurred so that they don't think straight about things. Maybe that now they're going to overdose because they don't remember how much they took. Alcohol is a good example of that. We have some of these in our society, and our we don't have dictators and tyrants here. We have public servants. So our public servants have a role to play in our society with these substances that have potentials for dangers and they're called regulations. And they're age restrictions and advertising restrictions and purity restrictions and, and taxation and all of these things. But whatever restrictions are put on to the dangerous things, they need to start out being the least intrusive possible on, on, on the choices of a, of a free adult. You get to choose whatever you want to have. You can have gasoline, you can have pesticide, you can have white sugar. I mean, that's a dangerous, addictive white powder that, you know, holy smokes. So you get to have these things, you're allowed to have them. So when they want to put restrictions on your access, they have to start out being the least intrusive and then whatever they warrant, you can add on to those. But when they get to the point where a black market takes over, you have to scale them back. That's the mandate of our public servants and the regulators, is to make sure that a black market is not viable. Because that black market has no restrictions and regulations. They're going to sell to anybody of any age, anything of any purity, and if you don't like what you got, your gang has to be bigger than their gang, and they're settling their issues with violence, and they have scads of money because they inflate the price, and, and there's so much demand because the act of prohibition increases the demand, and now all these scads of money causes the corruption that you see within the police department and the governments and all of these things. So our governments are way out of line in thinking that they can prohibit substances as public servants and the act of doing that causes all of these harms and, and problems in our society and does nothing of any benefit for us as taxpayers or anyone who has a mind to try to reduce the impact of drug abuse. The prohibition exacerbates all of the drug abuse issues. There's not much drug abuse with marijuana, there's no deaths, there's no addiction of any, any sort, there's no detox and rehab for marijuana users, it's not a concern. But many of these other substances have those issues attached to them, and we as a society need to do everything we can to protect the people that make those choices and make sure they're making the choices that they want to make for themselves. The vast majority of humans do not want to end up addicted to hard substances, laying behind dumpsters with needles in their arms. That's not where people want to end up, that's not what they're going for. If they really understood the 
parameters of these substances, they would avoid them on their own without having the government say, you have to or I'll put you in a cage. If you had a bucket of crack cocaine and heroin on the street corner and you said, help yourself folks, here's the truth about these things, most of us wouldn't go anywhere near it. 91% of us and more are on the other side of the street staying as far away as we can. But if you now put up a sign and say, and you can't have any or we're going to hurt you in some way, now you got 30% of the population that are over there having a look, giving it a little kick, trying to take someone nobody looks. These are problems we don't need to have in our society. They're caused by public servants being successfully lobbied by corporate groups, by gangs, by people whose interests are not the public's. And that's the real crime. That's, that's the real reason that we're here. That's why I'm doing what I'm doing and the other activists are too. These are serious crimes being committed by our federal governments at the highest level. That's it. They're in collusion with corporate interests. They're in contempt of the populace and science. They're, they're abusing their power and they're criminally misusing public funds in pursuing these policies, especially in today's world where we've even had the four previous Attorney Generals of British Columbia come out and write an open letter saying, that the case against prohibition is airtight, the evidence is incontrovertible. These policies have to stop. That's why we're here. It looks like, in fact, the, the policies about prohibition are the ones that are actually causing the harm. And a common law maxim is do no harm, and yet the laws that are there to protect us from doing harm are the ones causing the harm. It's crazy. It's upside down and backwards. Absolutely. The laws against the drugs are causing far more harm than the drug abuse ever could. Um, that's what the Senate concluded in 2002 as well. That, you know, the, the laws against marijuana are causing far more harm than marijuana ever could. Yet why are we still now, what, 11 years later, 2002, 12 years later, and our federal government is still spending our tax dollars to maintain these policies in the face of that evidence and all that's built since then? There's been no evidence to the contrary since the Senate came out and said what they said in 2002. There's no proponent standing up and giving good cause why we need to try to prohibit drugs and how successful we are, because we're not. It's like standing under Niagara Falls with a cup and catching some water and saying, look, my cup is full. I did something, but they're doing nothing. So other than protecting corporations and gangs, that's what they're doing. These gangs and, are and perpetuating their own jobs, and they're they're it's like a union, right? You know, they're it's they're like perpetuating the police state. Well, more more like what government ministries do than unions. Government ministries, they're given a budget to to do what they do, and at the end of their term, they have to justify where that money went. If they've got money left over, they quickly try to spend it, you know, and and that's what this is all about. That's why you don't hear very many. Any police, you do hear leap. There's a good yeah, group. Leap is a great, great. They are, but they're in the mini minority. Most of the police chiefs, you know, speak against uh, ending prohibition. They, they're all good with giving fines instead of putting people in cages, but they want to perpetuate their job. They're speaking on behalf of wanting to maintain the, the amount of people they have working for them and more tools and more money and more budget because we've got gangs and we've got all these drug issues, but they're not drug issues. People are not going crazy shooting people and raping people and doing things because they're on drugs. The, the shooting people in the streets is because this guy wants to sell drugs where this guy's already selling drugs and he's going to shoot this guy to get that job or something like that. Well, or maybe the pharmaceutical mind are altering corporate drugs that are really causing the harm. Yeah. Neil, thank you very much. You You've given much. us some great insights. Cool. Um, can I can I plug a couple? Yeah, of yeah. Uh, Stilltrippinmovie.com is a movie that we've just released that talks about why cannabis is still illegal. Illegal. Um, it's free on YouTube for a short period of time, and then you'll have to follow the links uh, after that uh, and uh, pay a subscription somewhere for it. But uh, Stilltrippinmovie.com worth checking out. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Neil. I am the secretary treasurer of Law Enforcement Against Prohibition Canada. Okay. So why are you here today? I'm here because prohibition needs to be ended and as Neil Franklin, the executive director of LEAP says, if you ask him when should prohibition end, he always says another day, another hour is too long. Because he's a former police officer, police captain from Maryland and Baltimore, uh, Maryland State and Baltimore and he has seen too many people die and too many neighborhoods ruined because of prohibition. And Neil's already talked to you about prohibition, and what he says is absolutely true. The reality of prohibition, and I come at this from an economics viewpoint, the reality of prohibition is that 
When you create prohibition, no matter what you prohibit, you create a black market. And when you create a black market, you are giving a monopoly over all the money from that black market to crime, organized crime, gangsters, and you're not only doing that, you're increasing their profits because black market prices are high. Prohibition makes them high. So, as Peter Christ, one of the founders of Leap, always says, alcohol did not create Al Capone. Alcohol prohibition created Al Capone. And now marijuana prohibition is doing exactly the same thing. And it's creating the Hells Angels, Los Zetas, the Michoacan Cartel, cartel uh, the Taliban are funded by it. All these criminals and terrorists get their money because we maintain prohibition. And that is the only effect of prohibition. It does absolutely nothing to reduce the supplier usage of drugs. In fact, it increases it. So do you believe that government has the authority, the lawful authority, over the products that we place into our body? Well, constitutionally, and this is funny because I am not a lawyer, but I have a not, lot of... Uh, experience and knowledge in that area constitutionally they can pass a law that they like you know and so they can pass that law but the issue with public policy and in my MBA I specialize in public policy economics the issue with public policy is the benefit needs to exceed the cost if the benefit doesn't exceed the cost then you shouldn't be doing it that's how you evaluate a public policy prohibition is a weird public policy because uh, mostly when you do public policy analysis, which is what I was trained to do, you fi figure out the benefits, you figure out the costs, you try to estimate monetary values approximately, and you balance them. And does the benefit outweigh the cost or not? When you try to do this with drug prohibition, something funny happens. You can find all sorts of costs. You cannot find one single benefit. There is no public benefit from drug prohibition. It has no positive effect economically or socially at all. It damages health because under prohibition, whatever you're prohibiting, it will be, there's no quality control, it can be adulterated, it always gets more concentrated. Um, why are people smoking crack cocaine, for instance? Because they can't get coca leaf. If you could get coca leaf, I would bet 80-90% of people who are using crack or powder cocaine would say, hey, that's better, I'll take that. I'll tell you some of the things that happen with prohibition. These are stories that uh, our LEAP speakers tell. One guy, he was about to do an arrest on some people who were drug dealers, and the uh, officer was in the house with the wire on making the buy, and the other officers are outside waiting for their time to charge in. And as this guy's listening to the wire, he hears... Uh, a six-year-old wake up upstairs and come down mommy I had a nightmare can you you know help me and he realized that he was about to take that mother and father and lock him up for 15 years and he says I'm not part of the solution to this I'm part of the problem another story not so painful what Peter Chris tells um, a lady in Buffalo, or Tonawanda, suburb of Buffalo, which is where he worked, uh, called into the police department and said, there's a guy selling drugs in front of my apartment. Do something about it. And this time, it just so happened, there was a plainclothes car only a block away. And so the dispatcher calls the plainclothes car, says, go over there. And they catch the guy red-handed, put him in the car, head back to the police station. And then, as they're driving back to the police station, the... Uh, front desk gets another call. Same woman. I called you about the guy selling drugs. Aren't you going to do something? And the lady at the front desk says, well, madam, I suggest you take a look out your window because we just caught that guy. He's on his way back to the station right now in the squad car. And the lady said, I am looking out my window and there's a guy out there selling drugs. The job opening was filled before they got the first dealer back to the station. That is how it works with prohibition. You're creating such a monetary incentive that there will always be somebody who wants to try to take advantage of that market and sell the drug and supply it. That is why in August, for instance, beautiful August evening, 7 p.m., I'm sitting on a bench in a park in Surrey. 
Guy goes by in a bicycle. Then he says, want some weed? Comes back the other way. I said, how much? He says, 10 bucks. I said, okay. Give him the 10 bucks. He says, I don't have it. My homie over there has it. I'll be right back. Three minutes later, he's back. He gives me the weed. I did not have to get up off my park bench. And I got some weed from a total stranger in less than 10 minutes. I can't buy a bottle of beer that easily. So anybody who says prohibition is reducing supply, completely full of crap. It doesn't happen. It, see what, how easy it makes it to get it. Not only that, if I went to buy the bottle of beer, if I didn't look old like I do, I'd have to show a card. The guy on the bicycle was not going to ask me for a card. I could have been 14. He would have taken the 10 bucks. So legalize or decriminalize and why? must be legalized because, now first of all, you have to be careful to decriminalize. It means different things to different people. The most usual meaning of decriminalize is it's legal to possess it and to consume it, and it's not legal to sell and produce. That is, in fact, what alcohol prohibition, prohibition was. During alcohol prohibition, it was legal to drink. What was illegal was producing and selling. It's making the producing and selling illegal that creates all of the crime, death, murder, rich criminal gangs that result from prohibition. And so you must legalize, because if you only decriminalize, and if that means it's illegal to be a dealer but still legal to consume it, you are maintaining all of the destructive effects of prohibition. Do you have any comment on the attacks of our fundamental liberties and freedoms that prohibition has brought us and these drug, lo drug laws have brought us? It is one of the most horrible aspects of prohibition. It has justified uh, destruction and ignoring of fundamental civil liberties that are the foundation of civilization. If you do not have the rule of law, if you do not have the civil liberties that underlie the rule of law, there is no civilization. And we are destroying our civilization via drug prohibition. When the police are put in a position where the only way that they can actually make arrests is largely to violate civil liberties because one of the fundamental differences between prohibition and real crime is that in real crime there is somebody who wants something done about it and reports it. In real crime there's somebody who says, my house was burgled, come and catch the guy. There's harm. There's harm and there's a victim and there's someone who wants something done about it. Now in drug prohibition, I want to sell you the drugs, you buy the drugs, we're both happy. Neither one of us is going to go and report the other guy. And because of that, in order to try to enforce these drug laws, the police are forced to, uh, to engage in entrapment, in spying, in all sorts of stuff that very quickly and easily gets to, um, out, of hand. Gets out of hand and it gets to, it gets to the level of ignoring and destroying civil liberties. And at that point, and here's where it's really awful, at that point, the police are perceived by the community as the enemy. And all too many the police now are almost trained to accept that. But what a crime that is. You know, you sign up, and a lot of LEAP members, they signed up 25, 30 years ago to be police officers, and they signed up to serve and protect. And when you sign up to serve and protect, to be put in a position where you are regarded as the enemy of everyone you're supposed to serve and protect, that's not a, that's not... That's the beginnings of a police state. It's the beginnings of a police state, and it's an intolerable position for both the people being policed and the police themselves. i tell you one interesting story there. Uh, Jerry Cameron, LEAP member, he tells this story, uh, and he's from somewhere in the southern U.S., and he told this story. I remember we went into one section of our town and for all practical purposes we cordoned it off and we did some real creative things stomping all over the edges of the Constitution and we cleaned it out. I mean we cleaned out every drug dealer from that area. Well to my dismay 90 days later I had the uh, Cubans to come up from Jacksonville and some of the Miami boys coming up and they were going around shooting people and beating them mercilessly. I wanted my old drug dealers back. So, in other words, you can violate all these civil liberties, get rid of these guys, but it's just a job opening and the guy who fills it in is going to be more brutal, more violent than the guy you got rid of. 
And ultimately, I think that cannabis is a plant that everybody has a right to use. Everybody, it was put here by the creator, and I don't believe that the government should have dominion or authority over nature itself. And you've shown that many abuses come when the lawful authority abuses that authority and takes control over things that they should have never had authority over. Well, they, they don't have authority over. There is no law telling a cannabis plant what it must do. The laws apply to people. But there's where I go back to my economic principle of a law, a government policy, has to be justified by cost-benefit. Except, of course, for malum per se, crime uh, laws against crimes that harm somebody, those are justified by nature, by, by themselves. But if you're... That's common law. That's common law, and that's, to a certain extent, you could consider natural law. It's also justified logically by the principles of the uh, Scottish Enlightenment, it's pretty clear. Everyone needs equal rights, which means if I don't want it done to me, then the law is justified in not letting me do it to you. And that's the logical principle behind it. But when you don't have a, when you don't have a victim, when you don't have harm, then any government policy has to be weighed on a cost-benefit basis. And on a cost-benefit basis, prohibition. The U.S. spends 70 billion dollars a year in prohibition. They would be far better off if they burned the money. Because by spending it in prohibition, they don't just do nothing, they make everything worse. So, there you have it, folks. I'm here at the Masonic Circus behind me, going on at the British Columbia Legislature. We talked to a lot of people about Sensible BC and cannabis reform. We got the real public information and the public sentiment behind these draconian cannabis laws, and hopefully we got the attention of some of these pompous politicians behind us. You can find us online at freedomfreeforalltv.com and wearechangevictoria.org. Be safe and be free.